Welcome to New Jersey Horror Con. We have the amazing Craig Sheffer with us. Thank you so much for taking the time, my man. Um, so, and the amazing Piggy, my and dog. And the amazing Piggy, yes. <laughs> tell, us, tell us the story of Piggy real quick. How, how old is Piggy? Piggy is uh, 13 or 12. I can't remember. Oh, my God. But I, bought, very... I, I got her from my daughter. Uh, somebody was selling um, dogs out of the back of their trunk wow. in um, California. And um, she was the one at the bottom, and they were all crawling over, and she was just huddled at the bottom. So, Aww. so I, I, I got her, and uh, my daughter was in the car. So, of course, I got her for my daughter. And, and then about uh, five years, six years ago, we come on up. Aww. And then, then my daughter went off into the world and college and all that stuff. And... Um, I moved back to Pennsylvania to take care of some sick family members where I've been for, for about six years, actually. I've been doing that. And um, so I brought her with me, and now uh, she thinks I'm her husband. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow, so in addition to accomplished actor, you're also a dog saver and humanitarian. I, I am somewhat of a dog saver and humanitarian, actually. I believe that, I believe that. <laughs> um, so we'll get started, you know, kind of go back to the beginning if we could. Um, Things got started for you when you initially when you moved to New York in the early 80s, right? Yes. Um, so what was the New York scene like in those days, and do you think that was a crucial experience for you early on in your career? Uh, New York was like crazy back then, you know? It wasn't, now it's, I guess uh, Giuliani cleaned it all up, but it, uh, at the time, um, it, was, uh, it was still, what was cool about it was still neighborhoods, you know? You had your Irish neighborhood, your Italian neighborhoods, and all that stuff. Now, they bought up all those buildings, and I mean, my first apartment in New York, I lived with um, five other busboys I worked at. We lived in a studio, and we literally just, the whole apartment was just mattresses except the, our kitchenette, and you'd just fall wherever you did, you know, and go to sleep. And um, uh, New York was, uh, it was really cool. Um, I actually had some really interesting encounters early on. My second day in New York, I lived in the YMCA for the first year when I could afford it, which was, I think, $11 a night. And um, I lived in YMCA's, but at the time, Grand Central Station and Penn Station were being redone. So when I couldn't afford the YMCA, I would go down and it was warm because you go down below the escalators that they were redoing and there were literally 50, 60 people down there. Oh, shit. Yeah, and I'd, I had my one suitcase and put on a big winter coat and just sleep down there. Um, but my second day there, it was really weird because I went into this bar that was about four blocks from the YMCA and, and uh, it was called Undu Trois. One, two, three in French. And um, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd were in there. And I'd, of course, been watching you know, Saturday Night Live since I was like 15. I think it came on in 75, which is when I was 15. And, and I saw them in there and I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. And I could only afford one beer, but I went up and I went, I'm an actor. I'm going to be an actor. I just came here and they were like, uh, Go, good for you. Get the fuck out. You know? <laughs> they weren't very nice. <laughs> wow, that's but, crazy. But, but it was it was crazy that I had that experience. And then my very first job was at a um, it was kind of a mafia restaurant called Jimmy Weston's. Um, and there I was a, a cashier in the back. But Frank Sinatra came in every uh, every Friday with his wife Barbara, and um, and the owner. I said, can I get his autograph? And I was keeping a journal at the time of my, my new life. And uh, yeah, I got, I got Frank Sinatra's autograph in that, in that journal. It was pretty oh cool. My God, that's amazing. So I had these like, weird little encounters, which I always, I look back on it now and I think maybe there was some kind of, maybe I was, had a little destiny there. You know what I mean? Could like be. just running into people because I don't think that's ever happened later in life, you know? <laughs> wow, that's funny. You would think it would happen more after your career started, you know? You would, th yeah. You would well. think. Um, so, 
one thing uh, I'm, I'm curious about is how were you kind of able to go from, from that stage to having a three-picture deal at Paramount so early in your career? Well, um, not at, at that, that first year for me was just survival. And then um, I learned from other, other people that I was working with as busboys and you know, other people that were trying to get into the film business. I was like, well, okay, so how do you get an agent? How do you do this? And they told me that I wanted to, you know, most people start, you start in commercials, you know. So the top commercial agent was a J. Michael Bloom agency. And I sent out, I got my headshots done because people, you know, you just learn through other people who are trying to do the same thing you are. And uh, I sent out my first headshot to the top commercial agent and three days later I, they called me, I went in and they signed me, which I don't know why they signed me because I had no idea how to do a commercial, but um, uh, they put me in a commercial class because I guess they liked the way I looked at the time. And, um, and I think it was only a month before I got my first national commercial and over the next six months I got four national commercials. At that time, they paid a lot of money. Uh, my very first commercial was, I got sent to the Caribbean. This is how long ago it was. You remember the Blue Lagoon? Chris Atkins and Brooke Shields? Yeah. So it was like 79. Well, it was an um, Orange Crush soda commercial, and it was a takeoff of the Blue Lagoon. But it was a five, five commercial deal. So we were shooting five commercials, and, I, and they sent me to the Virgin Islands for, for two weeks. I was in the Virgin Islands, you know, shooting a commercial, which I have, is still my favorite place in the world. I go there, but it was like, you know, very lucky. And then I got, you know, three more commercials over that period of time. Meanwhile, I had been doing uh, theater in New York while I was trying to get commercials. Um, the first commercial allowed me to not work, believe it or not. I made, uh, I think it was like $30,000 off those commercials because they were national commercials. I don't know, if, I don't think that happens now. I think it's, everything's a buyout or whatever, but. So I started doing theater, and the first one was the basement of a church. I played Romeo, I did Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, I, got a off, off, off Broadway, so <laughs> it's not even off Broadway, it was a triple off Broadway uh, uh, play, and, and then I tried out for a off, off Broadway play and got, it wasn't even the main role, but it was a, it was a small role, however, that director from that play ended up getting the director job in a play called Torch Song Trilogy. Um, it was the first big gay play on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It was the first, you know, nobody would make a play about gay people in those days. This is 1982. Wow. And um, so it was the first gay play off Broadway and, and the, the director called me in for a, uh, an audition. Uh, up against 250 other guys, Harvey Firestein. I don't know if you guys know who he is, but oh, yeah. he was the writer and the star of the play. And I actually freaking got the role, which was shocking to me because I had I had done about four plays at that point and a couple commercials. The play ends up being play of the year. I'm newcomer of the year, <laughs> and. Um, at the time, uh, they were uh, Paramount Pictures was making Outsiders had just come out a year before. Emilio Estevez bought the rights to S. E. Hinton's book. Um, that was then. This that now. was then. This now, thank you. Cause I was going to forget that. And uh, and they uh, were in New York auditioning actors, and because of my Broadway cred, uh, my new Broadway cred, they brought me in for a screen test. And they, and I got the role, the leading role in that movie, 
and then Paramount saw the screen test and gave me a three picture deal. So three years I went from being, you know, uh, just a guy living in Pennsylvania um, who I was playing uh, football at East Stroudsburg University and blew my knee out and the only other thing I was good at was uh, pretending. And uh, so I gave that a shot and had a lot of luck, a lot of fortuitous uh, circumstances that I feel like uh, brought me to the place where I got a Hollywood movie, Hollywood picture deal and I don't even think they do yeah, I don't think they Three do that anymore either. Three picture deals, no. that, you know, that stuff doesn't happen. Especially it, not if you're, you're a young up-and-comer, you know. You, yeah. Maybe, maybe they would give, you know, super megastars now a three-picture deal, but, you know, that's... Well, they don't want three-picture deals because they basically paid me not much for each movie, so that's why they gave it to me. But, of course, at that time, it was, like, a big deal. Oh, I mean, huge deal, yeah. I mean, I think I made 40000 50000 60000 Wow. Which... To me, I, I was I was rich, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's how that happened. So um, speaking of that, was then this is now. I've I've heard you talk about that role and describe it as one of your favorites from your early you know from your early films and stuff. And I was just wondering, um, what was it about that particular character that appealed to you? Well, that character. The funny thing about the character was it's it's the way I grew up. I grew up in a. Um, um, it was a, a, a in, in, our, in our small town, in the, in the city, it was gangs. It was white gangs, which is really interesting. So I was in the Windsor Park Boys. We had all these other gangs, and you, you know, it was all neighborhood gangs. So I grew up fighting, and, you know, it was, uh, it was a turf thing. You could go through somebody else's turf and and uh, so it was very much kind of the way I grew up wow and uh, and uh, it was pretty pretty easy for me to uh, assimilate that wow. that that wow. world well, that's incredible um, so not long after that you made a movie called fire with fire yeah and uh, worked with an actor named JJ Cohen what uh, an asshole yeah, I know oh my what? god I can't you know, tell you boy Just... too bad that guy isn't around you yeah know? I mean, thank uh, God thank God. thank God we don't have to deal with JJ Cohen no yeah thank I know, god. Right? what a jo JJ the jo <laughs> <laughs> he tortured um, me every day on set. he tortured you every day yeah he did he had he had you um, any memories of, of that film and um, you know I was curious what it was like to be in such an epic, like, tortured romance. Oh, my God. What, the JJ? I heard, you know, the funny thing is I came out at the wrong I time. I thought you fucking retired. No, no. <laughs> I came out at the wrong time. I heard Harvey Firestein, and I thought you said fire with fire, and I came out. Oh. Like this. No, I was Go just like, in. no, no. Like that. I, was like, I was like, you know, one sec, two seconds. How you doing, baby? Love this guy. I, yes. I, I'm just going to say the same thing. You stole my line. All Hi, right. Everybody. We so, had tons of fun. We had tons of fun. Awesome. I don't know if you can tell, but Chef and I actually have a similar workout regimen. We both do about a thousand crunches a day. <laughs> <laughs> I do Nestle's, and uh, <laughs> we spent an incredible summer together in 1985 in Vancouver. Ah, uh, yeah, that oh. was a great. Yeah, that was the year Back to the Future came out. Yep, and uh, I was in that, by the way. <laughs> and uh, you know, a little independent film. Maybe you've heard of it. It's okay. Small little. Wow, look at all those people. Jesus, thank you for all coming up. <laughs> My God, it's fantastic. What's that, about 97, 98 people? 99 change. Yeah. Close? Yeah, close. Under, so. Full house, full house. That's right. The important people are here. That's what I know. That's right, the real people. <laughs> yeah, we had a great time. Uh, whitewater rafting. Oh, yeah. You guys ever been whitewater rafting? A little, Have you? a little pre river runs through it, a little four little career yeah, four yeah, yeah. yeah. That was yeah. <laughs> the rafts were rubber in that one. Uh, <laughs> I mean in the one of our our experience with D B Sweeney, Virginia Madsen, we all D B Sweeney, Virginia Madsen. Uh, you know, it was after Fire with Fire. Let me tell you just something about what a great actor I think Chef is. I'm just gonna talk about you for a second. Yeah. Um one of the reasons why Chef and I have always had a certain respect for one another is because we took this craft very seriously. And um, I had done this scene with him in the rehearsal where, did you guys ever see Fire with Fire? 
No? Okay. Great. I know we got some one tree. I, I know we got some one tree hill fans over Anyone there. Anyone from Montreal? No? Okay. Oh. Uh, uh, did you uh, see uh, it? We shot in Canada. Well, if you didn't see it, go see it. And I'm not giving your money back if you don't like it, by the way. But um, we, uh, we were up there, and there's a scene where we're in a detention center. And he's, uh, he's the hunk, and I'm his best friend in the detention center. And I help him escape. And there's a scene where I give him the map, and he goes, well, basically, uh, are you coming with? And I said, no, you guys go. I only have a little bit of time left. I'm going to serve out my time. And when I auditioned for this thing, I was bawling, crying. And when we did four or five uh, rehearsals, I was bawling, crying. But I could not get there when we actually would get doing the scene. I was just cried out. So I said, do you remember this? No. Nope. So I said, chef, slap my face. And he's like, no, man. Now I, I remember. I can't. <laughs> I can't do that. I can't do that, man. I was like, please, man, slap my face. And he's like, no, man, I don't want to do that. And, and it was just such love, but anyway, he wound up doing it. And, um, and we did the scene, and it's an okay scene. But when you trust each other and you're working with somebody, I mean, he's one of the people that I would do anything with this guy again. I would do a play, I would do anything with him. Um, right now, I play a lot of tournament poker. Do you play tournament poker at all? I've never played poker in my life. Okay, <laughs> good, well, let's play that then. High stakes, <laughs> high stakes. Um, but uh, he, I just always thought he was a really incredibly talented guy. And then you went and did The River Runs Through It, which was awesome to me. Um, and then he did a, what was it, a, like a Christmas carol? The staging that I said to you oh, last night? Oh, the play, yeah. So he did a reading of a play, and it was on like PBS or something. And it was brilliant. I mean, the way he acted this thing out. I just have so much respect for this guy. I love this guy. And I, I posted pictures yesterday of us kissing, not, not on the lips. Not that we're above that. But uh, uh, it's just a, we just have a lot of love, and I, I really love this guy, and I'm glad you guys are all here to support him because he's really awesome. Oh, yeah. He's really awesome. He's awesome too, and I'm so happy to see him. Feel free to keep the applause so going happy. when he says he's awesome too. Oh yeah. Thank you very much. Very cool. So. So you guys are, you know, two hot young actors in the 80s. What, you know, are there any great party stories or maybe like your craziest audition, something that, We you know, talked about not talking about it. Okay, actually. okay, okay. No, we did talk too. about not talking about that. All right, all right. So no drug stories, though. No drug stories. No. Well, we, 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 I mean, if we had done drugs to begin with, we would not have shared those stories. Well, no drug stories unless... No. I'm unless, 22 years sober, by the way. Unless somebody here has drugs. No, yes. No? Okay, no drug stories, guys. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> so we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit if we could because um, I know there's a, a One Tree Hill fan in the audience here um, I've, you know, it's funny I love teen soaps and I had not seen One Tree Hill because I think I was a little older than like I was out of high school when it started but getting ready for this panel I'm like I'm going to watch a little One Tree Hill Fucking damn it I watched three seasons of that show <laughs> like I couldn't watch my other shit getting ready for you know to do notes and stuff so uh, I was curious what it was like to play such a wholesome character. You know, you've been kind of known for playing a little darker, a little edgier characters by that point. You know, you know what's funny? When I was younger, I, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but when you're young, you want to play, you want to play the, the, the you, you, you want to go to the dark places because, you know, you grew up on Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, and, and oh, yeah. you know, all yeah. the... De Niro, right. De Niro, Pacino. Pacino, all the, all the guys that... Yep. You grew up. You grew up uh, watching those guys do those dark turns and 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 amazing roles. And I was always drawn. Well, I played a lot of wholesome characters also early on. They were maybe in dark circumstances, but they were wholesome. So I think in my early 30s, especially after River Runs Through It, I started. I really wanted to play dark guys because that guy was so wholesome. And um, but by my I had my daughter when I was, you know, 33, and now I actually prefer to be the guy that I am, like with my daughter and all her friends, which is a mentor. Um, and so, when One Tree Hill came along, it was kind of a natural progression for me, and I, I, I really liked the character. Um, the original One Tree Hill was really about the family. It was about the the 
the two boys, the, the, the two brothers, me and Paul Johansson played the other character, and, um, and then the two sons and the mother that was split between them. It was, uh, it, it was kind of a Cain and Abel thing. Within six weeks of filming, the teenagers were what hit the internet and, you know, <laughs> people like all the teenage dynamics and we basically got, you know, phased out, went from, you know, our story <laughs> to the teen story, which was cool. And, 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 but I really, um, I really liked playing that character. It, it, it felt good and right and... Um, I got killed off in season three because... Uh, when I stopped watching. Uh, my, actually, what happened was my daughter, I, I brought her down and homeschooled her for the first two years, and then she was ready to go to middle school, and um, I, I, I was not comfortable not... Being there. Not being there, and Wilmington, it shot on the East Coast, and so that's how that story progressed. I left the show... I was gonna. I asked them to try to work my stuff so that I could come back every two weeks, and it really didn't work work out. So, and then they came up with the idea of killing me off, which uh, <laughs> yeah, you we, you can make plenty of time to take care of your daughter now. <laughs> <laughs> we have a better idea. <laughs> oh my Enjoy God. your daughter, pal. <laughs> You're gonna be seeing her a lot. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, very cool. But but I really like I like that character, and I, I I I I like playing characters like that now. I've I've not worked for about the last five years. I've been taking care of family. I've been back in Pennsylvania. My mom and brother both were sick, and um, mm -hmm. my brother just passed two weeks ago, which is oh, the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my life. Oh, and man, now so I'm sorry. going back to LA and going to uh, uh, see if anybody still thinks I'm interesting enough to get a job. Well, I, yeah, I <laughs> and then, um, you know, for both you guys, um, have you noticed any, uh, you know, differences between, you know, you guys have done such different types of work. Have you, can you spot your fans from, oh, this is a Back to the Future fan, this is a, some kind of wonderful fan, this is a One Tree Hill fan. Is the, is the interaction different between film and TV fans, or, or is it, you know, is everything just kind of... Well, I think where your film, like, I don't, I don't have any fans, just for the record, just so you're aware. No, Get I, 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 I you got a fan up here, my I, man. I have two, yeah, and no. one and two, and that's it. <laughs> you're in good company. Well, I mean, I've been in some a lot of movies, but I've never been in a Back to the Future type movie. So. Yeah, no, I'm kidding. I actually, that, that, I actually have a lot of fans, and I was actually like, in all three of the Back to the Futures, and it's been phenomenal to be a part of that whole thing. You know, I was the original choice for Biff. Um, Michael J. Fox was uh, the first choice to play Marty McFly, and he was doing a TV series called Family Ties at the time, and the producers wouldn't let him out of the contract. So they hired Eric Stoltz. I went back for this thing like eight times, and Eric Stoltz and I are about the same height. So I went down to two people, and Universal said I wasn't tall enough, and the other guy, who you know, uh, was too old, and the other guy was Tim Robbins. So neither one of us got the part, and they cast Tom Wilson, and then after a month and a half of shooting, they fired the guy you don't like, uh, Eric Stoltz, <laughs> and, they, um, and they brought in Michael J. Fox. And at the end of the DVD commentary, Bob Gale says, had, Marty McFly, had um, Michael J. Fox been cast originally as Marty McFly, J.J. Cohen would have been Biff. Yeah. And um, funny thing is, I was the third choice. I don't know if I ever told you this. I was the third, it was after Fire with Fire. I was the third choice for Goose in um, Top Gun. Wow. Whoa. And uh, yeah, actually, the, their first choice turned it down. It was uh, um, the ugly guy. What's his name? Nicolas Cage. What? And, uh, oh, to play Goose? Nicolas yeah. Cage was going to be Goose? He was going to be Goose, and he turned it down. That's insane. And then they gave it to Anthony Edwards. Wow. And he took it, and then I was the third choice. I was the only no-name at that time. Oh. I had just finished uh, uh, Fire with Fire. Fire with Fire. Wow. And you know, the funny thing is about dreaming... Because we're still dreamers. I feel like I'm still a dreamer. Uh, just for a better life and a better world and, and just, you know, more unity and less political division and all that shit. Um, um, by the way, go, go like my fan page, JJ Cohen, J. Perry, J. Perry Cohen. I don't do any political shit. If you do any political shit, you don't need to come. Uh, I don't care about either side, really. 
I'm totally neutral. Um, I love it all. Um, but the, uh, what was the point? I did, okay, I did do a lot of drugs in the 80s. But what was, <laughs> what, what, what was the point? Um, I, I was up for something. Where's my Top assistant? Gun, Top She's, Gun. Top Gun, okay. okay. So there was another film um, uh, called, I'm kind of like more known for the things that I didn't get than the things I did get. I was up for this TV series called You Again, Home to Roost. Uh, Jack Klugman was, I was telling you about this yesterday. Yeah. Jack Klugman was the father and I was the son and we both kind of have these dog faces. And um, I, they paid me an NBC holding contract. They paid me 2,500 to stay home and not audition for anything. And I actually took myself out of the industry to study after we did Fire with Fire because of that scene. And I was like, I didn't have a technique. I had some talent. And I had worked, I had worked in a bunch of stuff, but I was like, I don't have a specific way to call upon to get to, a, to, get to the emotion, to be the effect of the scene. I wanted to win Academy Awards, that was my thing. Um, that's what we talked about, like all the time. Um, it wasn't just about getting work. Um, now, at, at 54, 50, it's all about just getting work. <laughs> and if we get the award, great. But um, um, when, I, when I did that part, I couldn't have been happier. And um, anyway, they gave the part to John Stamos. Uh, and I made $11,000 for not getting the role. But I would have given it back to him. I remember saying that to my agent when they said, you didn't get the part. I was like, ah, give him back the money. I don't want the 11000 And the agent, of course, was like, no, 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 no. Let's not give them back the money because he's getting 10%. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but um, they gave it to John Stamos. And the show was horrible. And I love John Stamos. John used to come into my parents' restaurant all the time. He was a good guy. You know John? I don't. He's really a great guy, and he was a drummer, and I was a drummer, and um, he, he's, he's actually really a great guy. We used to see each other at parties, and he came to my parents' restaurant, Marilyn Crab House. Did you ever come to my parents' restaurant? My parents owned an a a East Coast seafood house called Maryland Crab House in California, and uh, he used to come in all the time, and he where really was, liked... Where was that? 25th and Pico. Oh, okay. And one in Santa Monica, and then we had I, another I one in Encino. I think I did go there. I think you... Did, right? You told me to go there, yeah, because... I grew up with Marilyn Crab. I, I, I went to Ocean City, Maryland every year for We went to Cape vacation. May, New Jersey. That's uh, what we did okay. from Maryland. Cape oh, well, May we would go to Cape May and, and take Wildwood. the boat. You know that big ship that, yeah, that would yeah. go to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, over. Okay. Yeah, and then yeah. Wildwood, New Jersey, and we okay. would get subs. And when I, went to Wild, when I went to White House subs, I got a ham and cheese the other night. Uh, okay, it wasn't just a ham and cheese. It was a steak and cheese also. But, they, but, the, but it was delicious. It was absolutely delicious. And you remember the days when we would get food and take it back to the room? Yeah. And we wouldn't leave the room? Uh, I do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I still do that. I love it. <laughs> Only now I have Netflix instead of weed. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, JJ, you were talking about some, you know, being known for some of the stuff that you didn't get, but you're also known for the things, obviously, that you did. Um, I was wondering, Craig, if you had anything to riff on that, because I know you actually turned down some, some kind of high-profile stuff. Is that something you want to talk about? If, if not, it's totally cool. Uh, well, yeah. Um, um, I turned down Platoon, by the way. You did what? I turned, turned down, down Platoon. down Oliver Stone? There was a role... You turned down what? Platoon. The role that Kevin Dillon played in Platoon. What? I turned that down. I turned down uh, one of the leads in River's Edge. What? I turned down one of the roles in Lost Boys. What, 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 and this what? is... A, and, and this, You're not the only oh, one I on the stage. This is a horror convention. You turned down Lost Boys. Yeah, Lost Boys. I was well, the what? Jason Patrick role. Oh, I was for the. Um, I know. I was for the one of the other little vampire guys. The reason why was because again, I just you know when you work with somebody who really takes the craft seriously, my reasoning was vampires don't exist. They're full of shit. How can I play this? Blah, I, blah, I blah. actually said that to Joel Schumacher. Did you? I, I said. <laughs> My my agent like forced me to go meet him, and he was such a nice guy, and I was such a he is a sweet guy. Don't he's a really sweet guy, and I was an, I was a young arrogant actor who was getting a lot of attention. And, uh, arrogant, no, but like I said, we you wanted to do great stuff. We were stuff. proud, you and were at proud. the time, a vampire movie just I was like I was like right I was like right I don't want to be in a vampire movie, you know? And, yeah, that's how I felt, huh? Right, well, that, that was about five years later. Yeah, right. that was five I years later when the car payment <laughs> came, came due. And we're like, ah, vampires, I learned my lesson baby. when it came out and made a million dollars, and Jason Patrick became a bigger star than I was. So I was like, okay. <laughs> I think I was up for the Kiefer Sutherland role in that, actually. And, and the, the thing about um, 
Let's make uh, it now. Um, what was the one with <laughs> with um, Keanu Reeves and the one I just met? River's, River's Edge. Edge. Right. Oh, so the script, movie. and we were big on this shit. The script, um, she gets killed, right? Somebody gets murdered in that movie, the girlfriend, and, they, and the guy at the end, they say, why did you kill her? And he goes, because she was talking shit. And I just thought, what a dumb reason. I mean, trust me, that's plenty of good reason to kill people. But, but not in a movie, and not like the whole premise of the movie and whatever. And I just thought, um, so I just wasn't digging that film. You know, that's a pretty fair critique of the film, actually. Is it? Is the, I think so, because I, I always like that it's a darker teen movie. It's, you know, like these characters, a lot of the kids are like kind of idiots. Like you see the guy like, you know, the, being interviewed on the news about the dead girl. And he's like, oh, yeah, like, you know, she was in my class. Like, I play guitar also. Like, yeah, and he's, like, yeah. Really the to script promote. was just kind of like, weird. People, like you know, teachers at school that had a similar thing happen it was based on said like, yeah, they nailed the kid characters right. Yeah. But but you're right. That premise of like you're talking shit. That's kind of dumb and, if the whole movie hinges and, on that murder. And I didn't feel like I had the depth to play the role in Platoon, and and I, and I probably did, but I I didn't. Uh, I think you know, you I was very very self critical at the time, and you know, again we. You know, Chef and I were the type of people that would be like, let's do another take, let's do another take. We can do it better, we can do it better, you know. And afterwards, they're like, come on, man, we gotta go, we got, <laughs> you know. And so I just, you know, I was very self critical. I wanted to do great work. I remember when I did 976 Evil, same thing. There's a scene in it. Uh, I what accept was it? What was it? 976 Evil, Robert England's directorial debut okay. as a director. And um, the way it was scripted was that I get thrown off the building. Uh, and I thought, okay, cool. Uh, what I don't want to do is I don't want to die like they typically die in horror movies. And I got thrown off a building, so I thought, well, that's a good way to die. And then once I got the part, it turns out they cut off my arm and then blood spurting out. And I was like, oh, shit, this is not what I wanted. And I'm being chased around by Stephen Jeffries, you know, who's a, who's a monster, who, who comes up to like here, here on me. And, you know, you can just kind of kick that guy and he'll, he'll fall over. And so, and so he, uh, he's chasing me and he's a monster and... So it's kind of gay, but I, I kind of hated it, you know, what it became. But I, I was professional, and I had signed to do the movie, and so I did it. Um, but that was a, it was a great, it was a great, ex oh, the part, here was the story. The story was, so in the scene when I had to get my arm cut off, I got the arm cut off, and I couldn't get emo to that emotional state, right? And so I remember again being very critical, and they were like, okay, we're gonna break for dinner. And I was like, I don't even deserve to eat. I just, uh, I'm not, I'm be in my room if you need me. I'm not eating. I don't deserve to eat. That was horrible what I did. Yeah, I was just very self critical. Uh, now, as you can see, I'm not that critical anymore. And uh, is anybody getting hungry, by the way? <laughs> or is it just me? I'm working up an appetite. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, so now we're doing these shows, and uh, these are a lot easier than any acting role, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things I think is interesting about what, what you were saying about the script mm. and, and, the, and the words you read, um, I, I, found, I found after the first 10 years, I kind of realized that it's really, you can have a very mediocre script um, or what you Great. view as a mediocre script, but what it really is, is the director. The director is, <clears throat> and I was, I was kind of an asshole when I was young because I, I and I was, I was taught this in my, in my acting. When we were coming up, it was like uh, method actors that don't listen to the director, you know, you're like, you create the character and da 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 da. And as, as, uh, as, I, as I got older, I looked at, um, because a lot of the directors wrote the scripts. Look at Lost Boys. It could have been just a terrible teenage vampire movie, right. but it was directed really well. Right. He had a vision. And as I got older, I realized, you know, you got to really look first at the director, I think even before the script, because there are scripts out there, and if you just read the words on the page, they, they can look wrong they, they can look wrong or boring or or s sometimes violent too violent or gross but it's all how the director handles it and what his vision is for that piece absolutely and as and as i got about 10 years into my career i started realizing i'm just a i'm just a color in a painting as an actor 
I'm a color, and even if I'm the main color, if it's, you know, the, if the, most of the painting's blue, but there's all these other uh, pieces in it, and th the director is, is the artist. I am a, I'm a paint in his, I'm, I am one of the colors in his painting. And I need to serve that, I need to serve that director's vision, right or wrong, and oftentimes I really did think they didn't know what the fuck they were doing and I was right, yes, and the movie didn't you, turn out yeah. good, but I, I can't try to, um, I, I gotta follow that vision if I've taken that role mm -hmm. and trust that director, and, when, and, and if you have an established director and you've seen his other work, you can take, I can look at a script and go, well, I don't really relate to everything that's going on here, but I've seen what he's done with other stuff, so he must, he must have a purpose and a vision for this, for this piece. Yeah, you know, to speak to that point, um, mm -hmm. that doesn't just apply in, in, in the entertainment industry. You can have a B product, a C product, and you got good management, and they'll sell that product. But if you get a, a, a C management with an A product, they'll run that product into the ground. And so, you know, the majority of directors, just like the majority of actors, um, are not that great. And so to trust them, um, you know, I did a film called Almost Famous. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, right? Ow. So, so where, where the hell have you been for the last hour? We needed somebody applauding. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was in Almost Famous, and best director I ever worked with, Cameron Crowe, hands down. And, and the reason why is because while they're setting up the lights, he's playing music booming through the boom box and he's setting the tone. Now when you're doing emotional memory or you're doing emotional recall or you're just preparing mentally for the scene before the scene, to have somebody put you in that state of mind, it just makes your scene so much easier. You're sad, you're, this, the scene is a breakup scene. Whatever the dialogue is, it doesn't matter. You remember the dialogue by rote and you work off the other person and whatever happens, you work off him. He's shaking his head now, so I'm gonna shake my head. And you're working directly off the other person, and it's moment to moment, whatever's happening's happening. So the dialogue is just part of where you go to. Fuck you doesn't mean to fuck you, right? I hate you doesn't mean I hate you. I hate you. Doesn't mean I hate you, right? So it's not about the dialogue, it's about the emotional preparation under it and what's going on. If it's a breakup scene and we're breaking up, usually those don't end well, right? Anybody that's ever broken up knows they don't end well. So you have your dialogue, you know what's happening in the scene, and you're working off the other person. And it's a very difficult thing to do, and the better actors make it look really, really simple. Um, I have to do a photo op, but he's one of those better actors. I, I appreciate you letting me be on this stage with you, brother. I fucking love you to death. I really do. I do too, but so thank you very much. I love you too. Thank you so much for letting me be up here. See you guys later. Have a great time. Love you, JJ. All right. So we do have, probably have time for one last quick one. I am such a diehard fan, I have to ask about the program. I think my spirit animal is at least 10 to 15% Joe Kane, like drunk Joe Kane, like, not, like, not like the healthy Joe Kane at the end of the movie. But do uh, you have any, any stories, any, anything funny to tell the fans about working on uh, the program? Uh, well, um, the great thing about the program for me was <clears throat> I actually played uh, college football and um, mm -hmm. at East Strasburg University. So when we did the movie, it, the, the team was called e Eastern State University. ESU, yeah. So it was ESU, Simple. and it was the same colors as my college football team. Oh, wow. So, Were you a quarterback? Uh, I started out as a quarterback. I was a quarterback in high school. We oh, won the championship. Get out. I was recruited by West Point. Didn't have the grades to get in, and about three weeks before I was supposed to, four weeks before I was supposed to go there, they basically said, because the coach was like, we'll get you in, I had like a 2.0 grade average, and you're supposed to have a 3.5, whatever. And, and my high school coach had, uh, was a football star at East Strasburg University, which was a National Championship Division II school. Oh my God, wow. So instead, suddenly, I'm going to East Strasburg University and blew my knee out in my sophomore year when mm. I switched to wide receiver. It's like the Alvin Mack storyline from the program. What's that? It's like the Alvin Mack storyline. Very from the much the like, Alvin Mack story. Oh my story. God, yeah. I love that guy. He was oh. such a great, he's such, I don't, I don't know 
if I've seen him in anything, but he was such a... He was amazing in so many different things. Yeah. Um, he played Buster Douglas in a movie about Mike Tyson. Um, he uh, was in summer school, the guy that goes to the bathroom. That's and right. He, was That's in right yeah. he, was in, he popped up all over the place. He's just, he's also just an amazing guy. I liked the storyline in that. Oh, uh, yeah. Related to it, obviously. Oh, yeah. But uh, so I got to do this movie and we went, we, we, we had three weeks of football camp. So I was in heaven, man. I just got to go out and playing with Division One. All the all the extras or the guys on the football team were Division One guys from uh, the South Carolina Gamecocks. So <clears throat> here I was messing around with Division One players, but I still could throw the ball 65 yards at that point. Whoa! And like I had a big arm, and and like they were like, "Wow, you're not just an actor," and you know, <laughs> like, yes, was, I know. It was it was very cool, and then uh, James Conn came on the set and shook my hand, and literally, I'm like, what what's going on here? He's squeezing my hand, squeezing my hand, and he starts doing this and talking to me, talking to me about a river and through it, and I'm like, what? And, and, and he literally squeezed my hand till I was down to his knee, and he goes, I'm just letting you know who's in charge here. Whoa! But but he was. Yeah, yeah, he was all, uh, he was you know, all, he godfathered me, man. Well, you know what he, he could have done, though? But, but By the it, end of I mean, it was in, in, in good humor, but it was uh, the guy, the strongest hands I ever, wow. I, I, I've ever felt in my life. Uh, wow, that's yeah. amazing. It, you know yeah. what you should have done, though? At, at one point when you're doing a, a take where you, where you were forced to kiss Christy Swanson, how awful it must have been, you yeah. should have looked over at him and be like, I just want to let you know. Who's in charge? Yeah, <laughs> I, well, I should have done that. Yeah, should have done that for sure. I was a little scared of him though. That must have been. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you after Iron Grip James Conn. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Well, we are just about out of time, guys. Uh, be sure to stop by Craig's table, get some pictures, autographs. I know he has a million more stories to tell you guys. And yes, thank you so much. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. And thank JJ wherever he is. <laughs>